Welcome everybody who's joining us. You can see the numbers shooting up, which is very exciting. So we might just give people a minute to um, arrive and log in and get comfortable. Sounds, sounds good. Yeah. Please make yourself as comfortable as you can so you can focus on the conversation. Um, yeah, and just enjoy it. Hi, Michelle. All right, I might make a start and at least start doing some introductions and grounding us for the day. So welcome everyone to our Partners in Prevention webinar. Today it's on LGBTIQ inclusive primary prevention work um, and we'll be in conversation with Rainbow Health Victoria. So yeah, good afternoon to everyone. I can see there's still numbers going up, which is both daunting and exciting. Uh, so my, <laughs> my name is Belinda O'Connor. I'm a prevention of um, violence Against Women trainer at Domestic Violence Resource Centre in Victoria, and we'll get this for more introductions in a bit. Um, but I'd first like to start with an acknowledgement. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and the custodians of the land that I'm on today, the people of the Kulin Nation. Pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I also extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Um, I also pay my respects to the elders of all the countries um, that we all might be on um, today, everyone who's joining us, we might be dispersed because of the nature of what's going on. Um, especially in light of yesterday being sorry day, I also really want to acknowledge the ongoing impact of colonisation, um, the work that we all still have to do. And I really want to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's ongoing resilience and resistance in the face of this violence. Um, I'd also like to extend a special recognition of Tyler's work of the LGBTIQ Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and elders and extend a warm welcome um, to anyone who's here with us today. Um, finally, I acknowledge that sovereignty over these lands and waters was never ceded, always was, and always will be Aboriginal land. So a couple of other things I'd like to mention before we get started as well. Um, kind of in that spirit, I'd also like to acknowledge all the First Nations peoples around the world um, on whose unceded lands and territories, um, the technology that we use, the infrastructure to enable events like today. Um, we might talk about the cloud, but things like servers, memory farms, tech headquarters, uh, they're all housed on land. So I pay my respects to those people and I don't take lightly um, the tangible impacts of our work in a globalized and a digitalized world. Um, also, as you all know, there's increased rates of violence occurring in this global pandemic. I'd like to recognize the impact this is having on women and children, as well as on family violence responses at this time. Um, at DVRCV, we support the critical work being done um, across the family violence sector to support victim survivors. Um, we also recognise that primary prevention efforts um, remain crucial um, and we'll continue to work to sustain and amplify our efforts to prevent violence against women during this time. So, yeah. Um, yeah, this numbers are still going up. Fantastic. So, yeah, thank you all for tuning in today. Um, it is so, so exciting. We've had over 400 registrations for today's event from our colleagues and friends across the sector and beyond. Um, it's just so heartening and exciting to see so many people interested um, in um, being part of this conversation. It's really important conversation about LGBTIQ um, inclusion in primary prevention for violence against women. So before we go any further, I'd just like to let you know we are recording the webinar today. Uh, we will be uploaded to DVRCD's YouTube channel. Um, we're only for filming the speakers, so no audience um, members will appear in the video. So I also want to just you know, reference the fact that hearing about family violence, transphobia, homophobia um, can have an impact on people, whether or not you have lived experience. So if you feel you're being impacted by the discussion, feel free to take a break, do whatever it is you need to do to look after yourself. Um, some really good um, numbers and services to have on hand. 1-800-RESPECT uh, provides specialised support to people who've been impacted by sexual assault domestic or family violence. You can call them on 1-800-737-732 or visit 1-800-RESPECT.org.au. Um, they also have national relay service and interpreter services as well. Uh, and for LGBTIQ specialist services, you can call the switchboard after hours line on 1-800-184-527. Um, they provide anonymous and free peer support and referral services. Uh, you can also visit qlife.org.au. Um, 
a bit of a note on tech. This is only the second webinar we've hosted. Uh, so we're really still learning as we go. So please be patient with us if we have any technical difficulties. We'll do our best to um, fix it all as quickly as possible, but hopefully everything will just be smooth sailing. Um, if you do have any tech related questions or comments for the duration of the webinar, please write them in the chat window at the bottom of your screen, or you can also email prevention at dvrcv.org.au. Uh, one tech related point I'd like to make is that you can increase or decrease the size of the speaker on your screen by dragging out the corner of the box. So, uh, Jackson, who we'll introduce in a second, Jackson will be taking questions from the audience at the end of their presentation. Um, so if you have any questions while you're listening um, to the discussion, please type them in the Q&A window at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. We're gonna really try to keep to time. And just to note that um, any disrespectful comments or questions will absolutely not be um, tolerated and they will be removed. So yeah, we'll do our best to keep as safe a space as possible. So with that said, on to the introductions. Um, today, we are very grateful to have Jackson Fairchild from Rainbow Health Victoria, um, who will share some um, highlights from Rainbow Health Victoria's soon to be launched uh, report, Pride and Prevention, which is a guide to primary prevention of LGBTIQ family violence. Um, we're going to have a conversation about the commonalities between violence against women and LGBTIQ family violence and explore ways so we can kind of improve inclusiveness in the prevention of violence against women um, in our practices and work. So um, as I said before, I'm a, uh, a trainer in, primary, in the primary prevention of violence against women space, but I've been really um, uh, honored and excited to have a role in the advisory group of this project. So that's my kind of connection here. So um, before I let Jackson introduce himself, I just want to add that um, being part of this group and this role has been so exciting. Um, it's very rare, I think, to go to an advisory group and everyone who's been part of it can attest that it was just electric and exciting and the idea flow was incredible and the synergies between the work was just so exciting. So we're really gonna try and bring a bit of that to you today. Um, yeah, so as I said, my name's Belinda O'Connor. Uh, you might know me as Belle. My pronouns are she and her. And um, yeah, I'll hand you over to Jackson to introduce. Hi, thanks for that amazing introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here today as well, and I'm really excited that we are doing this as a, as a conversation. Um, so I'm Jackson Fairchild. I'm uh, the Head of Policy and Programs at Rainbow Health Victoria. Uh, Rainbow Health Victoria is uh, a program that supports members of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and queer community uh, around their health and wellbeing through research, knowledge translation, training resources, policy and we also uh, own the Rainbow Ethics Standards that some of you, many of you will no doubt be familiar with. Uh, and in my role in that project, um, I work, uh, do a lot of work in our LGBTIQ uh, primary prevention program, which we're very excited to uh, have on board since last year. Uh, my background originally was as a, uh, a counsellor and then a family violence worker uh, working with men. Uh, around uh, men's behaviour change and stopping family violence. I then managed the LGBTIQ family violence program uh, at Thorn Harbour Health, uh, then called the Victorian AIDS Council, or VAC. Uh, and I also worked as the director of, um, uh, as a director at Nota Violence as well, and, and now uh, working back in the LGBTIQ space, which is fantastic. So um, I'm very excited to be here today. My pronouns are they and them. Thank you, Jackson. Um, well, without further ado, we might get into the conversation part of the session. Um, and we've got a lot to talk about, so <laughs> we'll try and keep it to the time that we could talk about all, this all day. So I think the first thing I wanted to just ask about um, and to let people know um, a bit about the guide that um, mm. is centred around and we'll do a bit of an explanation. So uh, yeah, Rainbow Health Victoria will soon be launching private prevention. That's right. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the project. So this guide comes out of our LGBTIQ Primary Prevention uh, Family Violence Project, uh, which is funded for the, by the Office for Women under the Free From Violence Strategy uh, as part of our efforts to uh, innovate and inform. Um, and as part of that project, you know, as a research centre, uh, Rainbow Health Victoria sits inside uh, the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society, which is part of La Trobe University. All of our work is research uh, based. Uh, and before we do any programmatic work in the community, we always make sure we're building that upon uh, recent research that we can use to point us in the right direction. So when we were uh, received this exciting funding from the Office for Women, it was really important that we go back and touch base 
having done some work a couple of years ago with our watch on the evidence, this evidence is always evolving. We thought this was the perfect opportunity to do a review of the evidence and bring it together as an evidence guide. The goal of the project um, is to uh, address some of the evidence gaps in this space. Unfortunately, when we're talking about LGBTIQ primary prevention, we don't have the decades of, of research um, that violence against women benefits from at this stage. And of course, there needs to be definitely more research and funding into the space for prevention of violence against women as well. But we really needed to figure out and develop our understanding of the drivers of violence against LGBTIQ people. And we thought, as a goal of this project, what we want to do is try and uh, summarise the evidence, bring that together, communicate that really clearly, and find a way of bringing that together to propose um, a conceptual model that we could then test through a series of interventions. And these interventions, very similar to the work that's being done in uh, the primary prevention space of violence against women, uh, is about looking at various different ways and different uh, sort of angles we can take to uh, you know, uh, approach this problem and challenge those drivers. But one of the main goals is that we knew that the LGBTIQ community hadn't been involved very much in the conversation and didn't have the same, um, I like to say, camera angle on the problem, but that they were actually using a very similar set of tools to challenge uh, inequality and the structural drivers that we've identified. We've also sort of noticed that there's a huge amount of commonality between the work that's being done in the LGBTIQ space and the work that's being done in the primary prevention space. And we thought this would be just a fantastic way of bridging those uh, conversations and seeing how we can actually work together towards what we think is a pretty similar problem, actually. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to be working with a number of community organisations, but to do that, we needed to bring together the evidence in a guide. And that's what Pride in Prevention is about. And we're really excited to say that we'll be launching that in early July uh, and that we'll be we're very, very excited to say that um, the Minister for Women, Gabrielle uh, Women, uh, the Minister for the Prevention of Family Violence um, and the Minister for Women, Gabrielle Williams, and our Commissioner for Equality, Ro Allen, will be jointly opening that event. So we're thrilled. Can't wait. And I was going to say, I think that's something I've, um, from you know, the participation I've been able to have in the advisory group, it is this. Um, beautiful connection that's happening between all the pieces yeah. that we're doing and, and that, that emerging kind of synchronicity and mutually reinforcing evidence and work. So it's very exciting. So yeah, I was wondering um, as well, I think just to maybe ground the conversation a little bit for people out there. Um, so we know that intimate partner violence um, perpetuated by a woman's uh, former or current male partner is kind of the most common form of violence experienced by cisgender heterosexual women in Australia. Um, but I think probably something that um, if people are less familiar with this kind of work, um, some of those the kind of grounding questions around um, how, how common is family violence um, experienced by people in the LGBTIQ plus community, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and how might it be similar or different? It's a really great question. Um, and, you know, just, I might just um, say, you know, when we talk about the LGBTI community, LGBTIQ community, we are talking about lots of, uh, communities that have come together under a banner, banner of solidarity that actually have quite disparate experiences, um, but a, sh a shared experience of oppression and also a shared story of resistance and of um, solidarity and working together um, under that sort of rainbow umbrella, hence our name. Um, and when we, so when I, when I give these numbers, there's a, a great deal more detail that goes down to each individual experience. Um, and in the, when people pick up the guide, they'll be able to see some more nuanced information. But we can say pretty confidently um, from research that we ourselves have conducted that the rates are um, uh, sort of similar, um, roughly the same, and in some areas actually higher. Uh, so when we're talking about the experiences of uh, transgender and gender diverse people, uh, the, the rates can, in some studies, are shown to be higher. Uh, and the rates um, for bisexual women can also be quite high as well. Uh, and there's a number of different challenges there on reporting that data as well. We need to remember that people uh, often aren't out and the experiences of actually gathering that information, there's all sorts of complex reasons why it can be hard to measure those numbers. Yeah. But the studies um, seem to pretty consistently confirm that the numbers are pretty similar. And the forms of violence are also themselves quite similar. Um, we know that, um, you know, it's again, different forms of family violence. Um, Often we focus on partner violence, but in our report, we're also speaking to violence from our family of origin as well. That the family, the experience of violence growing up uh, in a society that's uh, standing, you know, has some values and behaviours that um, 
of homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, and intersex phobia um, uh, play a really big part in driving those forms of family violence as well. But we're looking like uh, there's a partner, violence from current or former partner, from the family of choice. Um, there's also different forms of child abuse uh, and of course, other forms of violence like adolescent violence in the home and elder abuse as well. Um, and the violence can take, uh, usually takes this, a similar sort of form, similar sorts of control, similar levels of, of violence. Um, but there are some unique things that are a little bit different around um, identity based control and things like that. Restricting and shaming someone for their identity has been noted as well. Mm -hmm. um, policing people, forcing them to express their gender in a particular way. Um, uh, or restricting their access to community for our community's connection to your peers is just so important. Um, so isolation becomes a really complex risk factor. Um, so, um, but as you, as you drill down into it, you start to see that there's actually a, a shared experience rather than a different one. Sure. Yeah, and I think it may be um, by respecting the differences and, and the particular um, uh, experiences of people in these communities. For those of us who are working um, in preventing violence against women, keeping in mind those things of what people share while also the diversity amongst groups. That it's not Absolutely. a that it's not a um, monolith, just as no, women not at all. Yeah. Think these communities are monoliths. So I think it's a good thing for us to keep in mind um, yeah um, what is shared but what is unique for different Absolutely. People. Yeah. And I think some of those unique things um, uh, can be a real opportunity as well um, to sort of examine um, examine those drivers and their origins as well. I think as well, it's important to say that one of the challenges we have in the LGBTIQ space is it's difficult to know um, the fatality rates that are associated with this violence because uh, coroner's courts don't actually measure um, uh, the same, um, in the same way. They don't ask the question around gender or sexuality when they're speaking to um, someone's death. So we don't actually have that same data to be able to report on that. Yeah. We need to rely on victim survivors who um, are generous enough to share their experiences with us. Yeah, sure. Well, I hope, hopefully that will be a space that improves over time. So thank you, Jackson. I'm just going to put these in because a few people are saying that I'm breaking up a little bit. So hopefully that helps, but let us know. Um, and I think that, yeah, again, keeping drawing in these ties between the different forms of violence that um, all these different communities that we work with um, experience. I guess I wanted to bring it around to um, change the story and kind of mm. Uh, some of the, the core frameworks that we use in um, the primary prevention of violence against women. So um, change the story, which hopefully a lot of people tuning in today are uh, aware of, but if not, just to explain, it's the national framework um, and it's the evidence-based framework and it basically explains or um, illustrates how gender inequality is what sets the necessary social context um, in which violence against women occurs. And within that, there's four particular expressions um, that have been found to consistently drive or predict, high, predict higher rates of violence against women. And we kind of call, we call these the gender drivers of violence. So um, namely they are uh, the condoning of violence against women, men's control of decision-making and limits to women's independence, um, rigid gender roles and stereotype constructions of masculinity and femininity, um, which will be especially crucial to this conversation, I think, um, and male peer relations that emphasize um, disrespect and aggression towards women. So um, that's kind of where we're coming from in the primary prevention of violence against women's space. So when we're thinking about LGBTIQ um, family violence, I'm just curious to know uh, what do we know, what do you know yet about the drivers of that violence um, and how might they be um, similar and different uh, to those drivers of violence against cisgender women in heterosexual relationships? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, we really, you know, we owe a really um, incredible, um, you know, we give our thanks very much to the, the work that's been done by our watch in this space to really, um, you know, create this amazing platform that we're speaking on today. Um, our model is a proposed socio-ecological model. It's very, um, uh, it's very new. It's the first time that we've proposed this model and we'll be looking to test and further develop it as we move forward. So it's important that I emphasize that now, but it's, it's based on our summary of the evidence and what we think that evidence is suggesting, but now we need to do further work to evaluate and test that model through interventions in the community mm -hmm. um, to see how these things come together. So with that in mind, 
We also divide our model up into, and um, those who do come along to our launch will see um, that we divide it in the, the societal level, system institutional level, organisational and community, and individual and relationship levels. But at the very top of that, we see the words rigid gender norms, which I mm. think is a really important connection to draw. Uh, and we're talking here today, and this is where we get into the really exciting stuff when we start to yeah. see where, and someone wrote in the, in the comments, I can see there, my oppressor is your oppressor. And yeah. that just gave me this lovely feeling. I was thinking yeah. so many people are already on this same page, um, which is this idea that uh, the rigid gender norms that we talk about in terms of expressions of masculinity and femininity, the way we talk about our genders and our bodies as well, I just want to acknowledge the role of these drivers in the lives of intersex people as well. Um, we don't have a lot of data about the prevalence or experience of intersex people uh, in terms of family violence. It's too difficult to speak to, which in many ways, again, speaks to a silence around these issues, which is important to note um, that we're hoping to uh, break through by doing this work. But these rigid gender norms, this idea that there's a particular notion of what makes up a man or a woman, uh, this particular idea that um, uh, there's a, a good way of being those things and that transgressing those particular gender boundaries will be punished in a certain way or result in, in violence or oppression or a lack of rights or equality. Mm -hmm. that, that, that violence can occur at a structural level as well as an individual level. So we talk about the drivers and we talk about what it leads to. So we say that rigid gender norms and what we call heteronormativity and cisnormativity, which is this idea that being heterosexual and cisgender. Um, and for those who haven't heard the term cisgender before, um, cisgender uh, is for those people whose gender identity matches up with the, the uh, sex they were assigned at birth. So if you were assigned uh, male at birth and then you grow up and your identity is of a man, then cisgender is the word for you. Um, and it exists in the context of the word transgender. So to allow a neutral distinction between those terms. Um, and cisnormativity is this idea that everyone should be cis, cis, mm. is cisgender uh, until otherwise. And that cis is the normal and it's the one that's preferenced and privileged in the conversation. Same with heteronormativity as well. Um, and that these phenomena within our society leads to homophobia, biphobia, transphobia and intersex phobia. Um, and that we also talk at this level about um, gendered cultures of violence as well, which is the mm -hmm. idea that use of violence uh, and associated with that kind of aggression is in itself privileged within the gendered structures within our society. Um, and we do know from the research that uh, this, you know, that there's this suggestion that there are different uh, types of cultures of violence as well as those that are associated with that traditional gender binary. Um, we also talk about, you know, the inequality that's associated with that. I think it's really important to take that same lens in this work. And this is again, another parallel. Um, the recognition of our bodies, identities and relationships is mm -hmm. still not equal. We still have a lot of work to go both locally and around the world. We've made incredible progress. And this is again um, where that parallel work and where our shared history is. If you go back to the early works of our movements, feminism and um, what was then called the gay rights movement and then has mm -hmm. evolved into this broader movement. You know, we talk about, um, uh, you know, that idea of having a shared oppressor. Um, yeah. Those fight for rights are actually shared fights. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I'm really interested in this idea of rigid gender norms and particularly the word rigid. Yeah. Really stands out to me. Um, what happens to people when they transgress? What happens mm -hmm. to a, a man who is too feminine? Yeah. What does that suggest about the relationship between misogyny and homophobia? Definitely. Yeah, I think there's a lot of in, in there as well about um, also who's rewarded for adhering to norms. Um, and, and like you said, I think that the key part is the rigid part because it's not to suggest that anyone living their life, if it happens to um, go along with the more socially normative, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's about what happens to people who by their existence or by their choice or their life um, or their resistance mm. fall outside of that and what yes. happens. And what, um, I, get, I think moving from the individual to the structural, what is it upholding? Yes. Um, and it's yeah. upholding a um, world based on gender oppression and kind of patriarchal norms. And I think something I've been struck uh, in the conversations we've been having about the links between the gender drivers, particularly the rigid gender norms, um, is around 
if you are challenging these, if you are challenging these because you are doing work around um, LGBTI like Q liberation or freedom or resistance, you're kind of by definition challenging the rigid gender norms, which we know prevent violence against women. Absolutely. These things yeah. are so hand in hand. You, if you're doing one well, you're kind of doing the other at the same yeah. time. Yeah. They're just so intimately doing, connected. We're benefiting at each other accidentally. So what would yeah. be the benefit of intentionally doing this work together, I think Definitely. is the really exciting Definitely. thing that I think you know, like you said before, standing in that room of the advisory group and the energy that was building up and how we all couldn't stop smiling. Um, yeah. That in itself spoke to me somehow. Yeah. I don't know. And I keep talking about it in all the meetings we have about this project, that the, the project itself carries this energy that we're really excited about. Definitely. And I think an important point that um, was made in those meetings that you've mentioned a few times as well is that I think uh, any distinction or division drawn between the kind of feminist movement and the LGBTIQ like movement, mm. it, they've always been connected and they've always worked together. And mm. our ultimate goals are the same, is um, freedom from violence and the right to live full and expressive lives where we're not curtailed by whatever gender we've been assigned or, or whatever um, norms of social kind of uh, expectations that we have on us. So we always have a shared struggle here, I think. And yeah. I think the more we lean into that, um, the better for everybody. I agree. And, yeah. you know, and, and that goes for our communities as well. And I'll talk a bit about that later, about, um, I think, what uh, the primary prevention space really has to offer the LGBTIQ mm. communities as well. Yeah. Um, I might just park in what that for later. Otherwise, I'm going to careen <laughs> down a particular path and not actually answer your question. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> which is a discipline I've had to learn in these webinars. Yeah. Um, um, I think what's really important as well is, um, you know, like I was talking about about rights and and we're talking about the way identities are invalidated and that how that can create, you know, that there's this direct denial of rights, like there's this, um, you know, resistance to the, the idea that tr of trans self determination or the idea that um, people of the same gender can get married, um, or the idea that intersex people's bodies are somehow um, uh, a disorder and that they deserve some sort of correction to conform um, which in itself is a, when you when you sort of say it out loud you can hear the violence in that and that's something the intersex community have been speaking to um, really beautifully for um, a long time and it's I think it's really important that we all tune into that mm -hmm. um, but it's also about a failure to respond mm -hmm. as well um, that happens at this level but the inequality also means that some people get left off the end of the conversation and we need to be very careful about that. Um, and part of the amazing work of the Royal Commission was tuning into the people who have been left out of that conversation. Definitely. Um, and when the, and this leads, you know, we, we then start to go down into that organisational and community level where we start to look at um, uh, how um, our bodies, identities and relationships are devalued and the kind of stigma and discrimination that occurs at those levels. Mm -hmm. um, this idea that um, there's something wrong with us, that um, you know, we, we, uh, our, these ideas about our entire communities being somehow um, unwell or, mm -hmm. um, or bad uh, in some fundamental way. Um, and, and, and what we also get along in parallel then is communities not responding to the violence either and not seeing yeah. it. Yeah. And that's not only just the broader community, but it's our own communities as well that struggle to recognise that violence. We've been, all of these drivers exist both outside the LGBTI communities, the context in which we're born, but we're not separate from it. Yeah. We're born into this soup and um, we don't, our violence, the violence we experience in our relationships and um, with each other. And I think it's also, I haven't said this already, and it's really important I say this because it's often drops off the edge of these conversations. LGBTIQ people don't just date each other. We don't just marry each other. We don't just yeah. form relationships. Um, we, um, uh, you know, um, cisgender heterosexual partners of ours um, are definitely part of this conversation. So the drivers are also overlapping mm -hmm. in a very real way as well. For instance, a yeah. trans woman is affected by and lives in the context of the very drivers um, that are described within Change the Story, mm -hmm. as well as those that we're describing within Pride and Prevention. Um, yeah. There's different camera angles on the same problem even more gel when we're talking in that space. Yeah. Um, and we end up at this sort of idea and this, this, this level. And when we drill down to that individual level, we're starting to think about, um, you know, homo bi, transphobic and intersex phobic violence, the normalization of violence. Yeah. 
-hmm. as well. Um, the idea that it's okay to treat members of these communities in a certain way. Um, it's almost a dehumanizing. Yeah. Um, uh, and the impact that creates in the way that supports violence, supporting attitudes and peer relationships, I think it's really important as well. Peer relationships are fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. um, you think about those projects um, that talk to you know, young men and, and talk to challenging male peer relations is one of the important mm -hmm. sort of drivers. And if you look to those groups, those groups are not, uh, the, 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 violent, the, the violent attitudes towards women tra travel hand in hand with really intense trans bind homophobic violence yeah. and intersex phobic attitudes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's one of the um, other interesting points is when we talk about, I think something I reflect on in the gender drivers is um, we might talk about like men's control and women's lack of independence. So we might talk about uh, traditional um, stereotypes for men are thus and for women are thus. And we kind of have this binary in that, which we could possibly expand on better as we move forward. But also the, uh, we don't link them together enough to say this, we have this one because of this one, they're supposed to go together in this complementary kind of way. And even in the, um, I think in that, in that expression of uh, the gender drivers of the male peer relations, um, again, it's one where it kind of just focuses on men and it might talk about, you know, the disrespect to women, but it's not talking about what's going on between those, those men, those young men. Um, and how much of that is actually, like you said, to do with uh, homophobia or internalized homophobia. But once we kind of put those things together, it's the constant privileging of the what's coded masculine or male above what's coded yeah. female or feminine. It's not just like there's this, this male stereotype and this female stereotype. It's also that, like if you take really um, kind of basic traditional ones that men should be the leaders and women should be the nurturers, we also value that notion of leadership above nurturing. It's the, yes. that and that's hierarchical the power. Yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah. That the, the those in power should use violence. Yeah. Those with privilege should use violence. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because when we look at our relationships, we don't see a clear, you know, we talk about you know, where relationships where there may be a gender, a form of gender binary, you know, mm -hmm. or femme or, um, um, you know, that those are terms that exist outside of the gender binary, but that people often view them within mm. that um, idea of one's more mask and one's more femme. And that may not necessarily actually be true with the individual experience. But if we look at that, mm. those relationships, we don't necessarily see violence matching up with that, yeah. um, with those identities, but you do see it matching up with the use of those violent tools and where yeah. those violent tools sit, totally. who they sit with. And I think that's one of the things which, again, is a, an important synergy between um, all, all of this work, which is to say that this is all socialised. This, this is not biological essentialism. This is not coming from a person because they're male or because they're female or because they're butch or they're femme or whatever it might be. This is about the socialisation into yes. a, a, a violence approving world. And, and these, this is where that possibility for change, because if it is if it's something innate about any certain identity, we, we lose the possibility for change. But once we know, we, we know from the evidence that this is from socialization, from norms, structures, drivers. Um, so I think for all of us in all of these communities, uh, we can, I think I can see it starting to move beyond that. We can start, I think more and more people are understanding this isn't coming from a certain person because of who they are. This is coming from our social system. And we now have the evidence base to start challenging that. Um, and again, I think that's where there's so many synergies, because like I said before, the, the work that you're doing to challenge that and the work that we're doing to challenge this, it's the same challenge. It's the same challenge. Yeah. I really believe that. And I think this is where the evidence is starting to point us. Um, and we approach this with a curiosity. And we, again, we're testing these ideas, um, but we're testing them with, with a real sense of excitement about what might be possible. Yeah. And this work's gone back, like we said, it's gone back yeah. a little, a couple of years ago. And we talked about in that, there was an hour watch report that was put out with Rainbow Health Victoria at the time. And, you know, we talked about the links between, um, you know, the idea of a real man and a real woman, that they're necessarily heterosexual, they're necessarily mm -hmm. cisgendered, they're, ne yeah. they're necessarily non-intersex or endosex is a term that's sometimes used to describe people um, uh, who don't have an intersex variation. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the sheer idea of our existence is a provocation. Yeah. It, yeah. we, we, by our very nature, break those boundaries. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something really special. 
Um, and it's sort of almost given me even a more, a greater zest for my own pride mm -hmm. and the pride of the work that we're doing together. Yeah. Um, and what it means to celebrate and affirm, not just accept, what it means to go beyond. And to, um, you know, if we, we're in our work, we sometimes use this wedding cake model, which you may have mm. seen. I think we've shown it potentially to you. I've shown it to you before. Um, we use it in our training work. And it's, it's just a way of explaining the different identities. But one of the points that it makes is this idea at the top, we've got a, a man and a woman standing together and then as we move through, the, the man's standing one level up, you know, to really show his privilege um, and the way that um, society privileges his position. But he can't be there unless he's heterosexual, cisgendered, non-intersex, unless he fits those boundaries, which I think suggests something really interesting and really exciting. Definitely. Um, and, uh, you know, Again, I think that violence acts out in a lot of different ways within our society, not like, like violence against women. It's not just family violence. It's, mm -hmm. it's all sorts of violence. It's, it's, it's violence in the street. It's structural violence. Um, it's the, you know, uh, violence within the medical system as well. Um, and the unconscious assumptions that we make, it, 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 it's very similar to the same um, lenses that are used within that primary prevention space in the mainstream. Definitely. And I think some of that, um, those unconscious assumptions and norms and things like that, um, while they fall differently on different people um, for different reasons, which with different severity, I still think even of the, those of us who are privileged, people who might be cisgendered, heterosexual, those things aren't good for that cohort either. Um, like we're having a conversation before, like if you think of really traditional um, gender norms, rigid, rigid gender norms and expectations. For example, the pinnacle of a woman's life is to marry a man, which mm. it, it's easy to forget that very recently and, and still currently that is a thing. And whether it's because uh, you might be someone who uh, is attracted and dates men or not, that's not good for anyone, that expectation. It, it falls differently for different people. But I think a lot of these things, to keep bringing it back together, and I'm reminded of the work we do in the primary prevention of violence against women field, we're constantly talking about engaging men and boys. Hmm. So this is the speaking back to your point. About, bring that up. Yeah. yeah, speaking about um, who is a community? What is a community? How do we define these things? Um, and we know that for all this work to be successful, we need men and boys to be engaged. Absolutely. And, and just like with this work, I think people who are not part of the LGBTIQ community, we need to be engaged. And again, not, not to take the focus of those most marginalised and those most affected, but this benefits all of us. Like Absolutely. Rigid, these rigid gender norms and stereotypes which lead to violence against these communities are the same things leading to violence against women. And ultimately, even for men, even for heterosexual cisgender men, they are trapping them in, for people who are aware of the man box concept Absolutely. and research. We, what would be possible for all of us beyond this rigidity, if this was taken away, what kind of lives could we all be having? What, what kind of violence-free oh. um, freedom of expression? Like we, we often talk about preventing, but like what's possible? That's yes. so exciting. Yes, I imag imagine a world where there's no homophobia, where no one's afraid of who they form relationships, who they have sexual contact with, who they're attracted to. No one's afraid of the, how their bodies express themselves, where they can express their gender identity in any way they like, where they can form relationships. Mm -hmm. Imagine a world where, and if we're gonna take a moment, like you said, to just link in the role of men and boys in this space, um, what would happen for masculinities mm -hmm. if we were to do that? Yeah. And you know, we recently had that fantastic report put out by um, Shane Taz at Our Watch, um, the, men who, uh, the Men in Focus, um, yeah report, which if, you, if people haven't read, I really suggest you go and have a look. I was lucky enough to be on the advisory group for that. Um, mm -hmm. And there was this idea that that was where we actually draw our reference from uh, the connection between uh, misogyny and homophobia. Yeah. Um, and it also points towards this idea of a gender transformative approach, which is something that, that I've been reading a lot about the research emerging out of prevention work, which, you know, as you would know, Bill, but and for those of you who were linking up, um, uh, you know, this idea of um, what would happen if we, not just speaking within the frame of what we've been offered, if we actually sought to offer a broader frame. Mm. 
anyone can remain where they are. That's totally fine. Uh, if people, if the traditional idea of masculinity or femininity personally suits someone, we're not here to take that away. What we're here to do is offer options yeah. and offer freedom. And what would happen if we were to take an approach, you know, the gender transformative approach says, be careful about not gender reinforcing, you know, not saying real men don't hit women because that, mm. you know, says this idea that there's a real man and we need to be really careful about that. A gender transformative approach seems to offer uh, men in that same conversation a, a transformative option. And I think that cannot be done without homo, homo bi, transphobia and sexphobia being taken out of the picture. Totally. I think so many people are operating on an entertainment of boys, for an example, and obviously generalising, because um, even within that cohort, there's a huge amount of diversity. But what if that fear of um, being or being perceived to be gay, for example, to be transgender, whatever it might be, even just to be feminine or effeminate, if that fear was taken because the threat of violence yes. was gone, and instead that could be a celebration and a uh, something exciting and, and a new way of you know, interacting and, and what, what that would blow open for all of us and everybody. And, and this know, is just, where... I love to think about that. Oh, I stay awake at night thinking about it. <laughs> it really is the, the highlight of my work at the moment and for our team as well. It's just such a... And I can see there's a few people sending through chats saying they've got goosebumps and they're having these... Mm. There's feelings coming up during it and that's that's creating feelings in me. So mm -hmm. thank you everyone for your generosity and enthusiasm because it is so um, it is so exciting. It is also a bit edgy. We are moving yeah. into a, a, a new space. It's a learning space. Um, we're looking at transforming some pretty big structures. Um, and we also, I think we need each other. Yeah. That's what comes up for me in this moment. I'm feeling the support in the room and what that says to me is that often in this work we feel not supported. I think that's true for all of us in the primary prevention of any sort of violence, this sort of gendered violence that we're all talking about in different ways. Um, and sometimes we're also working against the same people who are working against us. Mm -hmm. um, that, um, you know, the same people who seek to dismantle and derail the conversation are trying to dismantle and derail our conversations in the LGBTIQ rights yeah. movement as well. And I think that in itself is quite telling. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, as I feel these positive feelings wash over me, I feel that melt away a little bit. I feel yeah. that, I feel a new, a new, a new sense of courage, <laughs> I suppose. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, we, uh, yeah, um, I'm a bit lost for words in this moment, mm. actually. <laughs> well, I think, I think as well with that, just like we know in the, um, I'll just quickly address someone made a comment about um, the man boxes from the um, Jesuit social services, the mm. project they did, if you want to look that up, but we can send out links. But in terms of, um, yeah, you know, what you said, it's quite telling that often the people who are against maybe your work or my work, to, you know, to broadly speak in that, um, are often the same people are coming from the same places. And I think that, again, shows the synergy and that we're on the similar reinforcing shared path. But I also think it speaks to the fact that we're doing something right. Yeah. That, um, that this is powerful work, because like we know from um, resources such as unpacking, uh, sorry, encountering resistance from yes. health and the evidence that's emerging around that is that resistance really happens when the work is powerful and yes. when it's having an effect, because people don't really make the effort to push back against something they think is ineffectual. Yes, so I think resistance that, is good, a good sign. If you're not getting resistance, exactly. you're not... You're not, totally. you're pushing in too soft a spot. <laughs> totally. So I think it shows the power of this work and, and the, the, the more and more that there's this mutually reinforcing work uh, is, is even greater power. So um, I think, that yeah. Words, just, that, sorry, can I just pick up on yeah. this phrase, that mutually reinforcing? I think that really, that, that phrase, when I read Change the Story, um, which I've, I must, I've read so many times now, and every time I read it, I, I, I do take something new from it. Um, and it talks about the mutually reinforcing response. And in our work, that's a phrase we've chosen to carry over um, mm. very strongly. We think that the mutually reinforcing approach, that we can only approach this from a range of different angles and that the way that primary prevention does that through messaging, bystander work, civil society leadership, all of those different, you know, work in the workplace, work in the families, work mm. in the community, um, building coalition, all of those things. Um, we're taking a very similar approach yeah. in, the, in the suggestions that we're making in the guide about what we think needs to be done. And that also speaks to, um, I think mutually reinforcing is, is almost 
what we're saying here that the work that to prevent LGBTIQ violence and the work to prevent violence against women is in itself mutually reinforcing. Yeah, yeah, I think that's like a real, uh, I think one of the things that have really stuck with me through being part of this advisory group and the thinking we've been doing around this as well um, is that often we're not even talking about doing necessarily a bunch of different work which happens to feed into each other. It's about doing the same work that we're already all doing and just mm. deepening our thinking around it. Yes. Like it's not about going in and getting a whole bunch of new drivers, for example. It's about deeply thinking about the gender drivers of violence from change of story and thinking what are the heterosexual or heterosexist assumptions here? What are yes. what, what assumptions are in this about someone being cisgender? What are the assumptions here? Or where does someone who's intersex, what does this mean for them? Like, yes. And it's all there and it's all in there. So it's, I guess, something that I'm really struck by is it's not that necessarily we have to go out and do a whole bunch of new work and, and the specialist um, organisations and services who can go and do the specific work that is, is needed. Absolutely. But for those of us in the um, PBOR space, uh, I guess I just really want to invite people into uh, taking the approach of deepening the work you're currently doing not having to go out and read a million new books and, and train again in something else and all that kind of stuff, but just to think what is already here in this that I know. Absolutely. I mean, it's tools from the toolbox, you know, um, we, we, our approach, and we will be working on, you know, various ways of um, offering these learnings and communicating them in different ways. Um, but our approach is very much to look at what, what from what you're already doing, can you apply and how can mm. we support each other? How can we, open up our toolboxes and pass things to each other mm -hmm. um, and or to say, oh, you, you've got that tool too. We use it for this. Maybe, maybe that would be another way of using it. Yeah. I think Absolutely. that's where it's, it's, it's like suddenly uh, someone offering you their entire manual of practice and saying, maybe there's something here you could use too. Yeah. And maybe totally. if we both used each other's manuals, we would approach this problem in a, in a different way, which I find really exciting. Yeah, um, I, you know, and it's really important to emphasize that um, in no way are we, you know, these are, these are approaching a similar problem from different angles, but we will be using different language at different times. I think that's yeah. important to emphasize that too. Um, and um, uh, this is about and not or. Uh, yeah. um, I think it's really important to, to sort of bring that in at this moment and say, um, you know, we're looking at um, uh, mutually reinforcing and complementary work, not, not suggesting that one be done at the expense of the other. Definitely, definitely. I think we want to do away with the idea of one at the expense of the other. This is like collaborative, mutually reinforcing, mm. um, shared struggle, shared movement. I think that's really what I've been taking away from this project. So it's so exciting. Um, and on that, I guess I wanted to ask, like talking about this kind of integrated, mutually reinforcing approach of us all working together for this shared goal. Um, kind of, what kind of actions could um, practitioners and organisations in the primary prevention of violence against women's space take to kind of uh, start to think about this kind of stuff and embedding it into their practice? Um, do you have like any examples or cases? Yeah. Look, I think we need to start simple. Um, mm. My first request is everyone, please read the guide when it comes out. <laughs> yep. um, it's a bit of a shameless plug, but we actually think it's pretty good. Um, yep. But also there will be a range of different LGBTIQ prevention training options emerging into the space over the next little while. Uh, we can expect that to happen as, as this dialogue grows. Chances for conversation, for training, for sharing, to keep your eyes out and to be curious about those options and to um, look at how you can make those available to yourself and your colleagues. It's a really important thing to do. Mm -hmm. But starting at home is a really important thing, I think. Um, when we're doing a, you know, a simple thing of going, okay, let's just check in ourselves what assumptions are we making? And it's important that when we say the mm. word assumptions, assumptions aren't necessarily bad. I, you know, yeah. Coming from a research centre as I do, assumptions are important to um, put in place. So we just need to make sure that we're keeping an eye on what assumptions we're consciously making and not letting our unconscious assumptions drive things. So when we're looking at doing a desktop review of, of your own campaigns or works and with a curiosity around are we accidentally reinforcing the idea that there's only a gender binary in our language? Mm -hmm. It's important that we speak to um, the dynamic and the, the issue of men's violence against women, but um, when we're talking about these issues and gender in general, are we accidentally uh, suggesting that that's the only uh, dynamic that exists and what might that mean in the broader context, both for people in the LGBTIQ community, but for, people, for all uh, of society? So doing that kind of reflective exercise as a sort of desktop review is a really fascinating mm -hmm. exercise, I think. 
Um, and allow me to say, coming from the LGBTIQ space, we need to do that all the time as well. We're not immune to this. Um, so um, it's something that we've got quite a bit of experience with. So if any communities are interested in that, we can, those of us working in this space, both Rainbow Health Victoria and other organisations um, can, that are community led and controlled, can, can assist with that. Um, and those organisations, locate them, you know, um, find the local group that is relevant to the communities that you service um, and build a relationship with them. Find out about how they're being affected by rigid gender norms and homo, bi and transphobia, intersex phobia, hetero and cis normativity. Ask those questions. What do you mm -hmm. think the problems are right now? What kind of pride programs are you running? If you ask that question, thinking about pride programs as a form of prevention um, mm -hmm. and um, see if there's any parallels. Are there any ways your programs can complement each other? Are there any ways in which your communities of practice on a local level could mm. click in and talk to each other? Mm. Um, share this if they haven't seen the guides that we're putting out, share it with them and suggest that having a shared conversation. Mm. It's a really simple, some really simple steps I think would be really, really powerful at this point. Um, and the other thing to do is to do your own work at home. And I'm at, you know, this is where we bring in this idea of um, each organization, just as we do in primary prevention needs to um, check its own gendered assumptions within the organizations. Mm -hmm. We also need to be checking out hetero and cis normative assumptions too. Options like the rainbow tick um, or, and uh, the, the sort of training packages that underpin that kind of accreditation model, um, you know, can really help us get it right at home before we go and do it in the community. Absolutely. It's great. And I think, I think as well, more of a, um, I guess, somewhat more esoteric tip as well. I think for a lot of people, just the sheer numbers we've had come today, which is just, you know, incredible. And I think the groundswell support for this kind of work, I, something I see in my work a little bit um, is people really wanting to do something and really wanting to be part of this, but being a little bit uncertain or unsure. And I guess, I would encourage people to try and just lean into that a little bit and, and it's okay. It's okay not to have all the answers. It's better to start your journey of trying to learn and have a go than to be so scared of uh, saying the wrong word, doing the wrong thing uh, to, to prevent that from you from um, stepping forward into that. So it's okay. It's okay to be at the beginning of a journey with this. Oh my it's God. Fine. We, we yeah. get it wrong with each other all the time and we have to yeah. um, uh, help each other and, and educate each other. That's, I think, that curiosity and being up and engaging in that good faith yeah. uh, is what's important. I mean, you know, like I said earlier, we in the LGBTIQ community have our own work to do. We need to work on our rigid gender norms. We need to work on our misogyny mm -hmm. um, and our, our sexism. You sometimes see, um, you know, femme shaming and an attack on, on the feminine people within our communities and privileging and masculine expressions mm -hmm. um, uh, re-emerging and sort of replicating itself. And it's it's... You know, we have to do that work ourselves to make sure we don't fall into that, uh, to, to fall back into that um, particular uh, pattern because of how destructive it can be. Definitely. Just like the point you made earlier, yes, we may draw out certain groups of people to focus on specific evidence or um, things like that. But at the end of the day, we're all part of the same society. Um, like, yeah, it's really hard. We have absorbed this stuff for a really long time. We're all in a process of both unlearning Absolutely. to relearn and I think for everyone just to have, um, to be okay with a bit of that vulnerability and supporting each other in that is oh, fine. Of course, well, it's welcome. It's welcome. So don't be it's, scared. It's not only welcome. I think if you're not experiencing it, if we're not experiencing it with each other, then again, if we're not, how can I say this? I think in my own work, I've noticed a resistance in myself at times. And I've, I've reflected and noticed structures and ideas and assumptions over my years. You know, I didn't, always sit in the position I am at now. Mm. Um, I don't think any of us have. We've all, yeah. we've all grown as we've gone through this work. And I think about um, what we need to do. You know, we're stepping into a new space. This is new learning. We need mm -hmm. to, um, first of all, I mean, I would suggest that we cannot achieve freedom and liberation on our own, um, particularly when that oppression comes from the same source. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, we're raised within those structures and that we need to create a learning culture that supports learning and supports us to safely um, explore these ideas, um, but that we also centralise the humanity and the dignity and safety of those who we're talking about and the people who are 
at most risk within these conversations. And we do need to take care and respect while being brave. Yes. And I think that's really important as well. Absolutely. And I think that's where that, um, you know, uh, the curiosity, seeking more information, seeking more knowledge, going to the experts, going to the expert um, organisations, doing your own self-education and work. Um, so we can have that perfect balance between people being not too scared to even try um, versus, but also not just going in, barreling in um, and not being aware of the effects that might have on people who are already really marginalised. So, yeah, I think that's a really good, really good balance to strike. And I just want to acknowledge that it's okay and, you know, we need to, um, we need to take responsibility for learning and doing mm -hmm. some Googling, but it's okay if we don't learn everything all at once. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a great comment in the chat that someone I can see there that some someone has volunteered something really vulnerable, um, which is just the idea that being fear of getting it wrong can sometimes mean we're quiet. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I just want to acknowledge that and say I hear that, and um, it's why we need to create a range of different learning spaces um, to learn in. Um, yeah. And um, uh, we need to be really um, mindful of. Um, that sort of learning. We also need to be careful, um, you know, just keep an eye out for things like backlash um, as we do within the broader space. Um, and um, that's another a mutual opportunity for learning and sharing too, I think. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's another great comment in the um, chat here about just acknowledging historical and current issues with feminism and, and the women's movement, really focusing on cis and hetero women and excluding trans women. So I think um, of, of the LGBTIQ community of which everyone obviously is important, but really focusing um, mm. for a second on trans women and just little things like I think for a lot of people have you ever read writings by trans women How, are you engaged with art yes. and media that's being created by trans women oh. like th this is the kind of stuff that um, we can do mm. um, and I think it's when people I think are a bit scared like like you know, like you said Jackson when you when I reflect on my own fear or resistance of something it's usually that I don't know and I'm a bit scared of that so it's like how can I who, who do I not know? Who work am I not engaged with? How can I find that? Not only to like um, build community, but to be exposed to a whole new world of expression. Absolutely. Um, and have that fear dissipate. Absolutely. Oh, I get, yeah. I heard once um, an anti-racist speaker saying, before you speak, make sure you listen first. Mm. Um, and the, what you said about listening to stories, tuning into the narrative, the art, the, the history, mm -hmm. um, the real human experience is absolutely f so important yeah. um, and one of the things that we all need to do for each other really carefully. And I'm really pleased that someone raised that. Um, and I thank them for, for naming that. I do want to say, you know, as I said before, we use specific language for sp specific things, mm -hmm. but we also need to take care in our language and make sure we're not accidentally leaving, leaving certain people out or reinforcing yeah. inadvertently things when we do. And I think that's an emerging conversation and we're going to be exploring that more as we go through. Definitely. I suspect there will be more spaces for us to dive deeper into that at another time and to bring in a, a diversity of perspectives on that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we, we want to make sure that, um, you know, when we're also thinking about what we're saying, we don't think we're only speaking to one community. Any message that's sent to the whole community, LGBTIQ people hear as well. Mm. Um, and in fact, they may hear it more. They may hear it louder because the ears are open and listening for messages. There's a hypervigilance checking in uh, about those kind of gendered messages. Um, and we need to be very careful with this idea. You know, I think patriarchal framing set up our narratives is separate. Um, and we need to just be careful about that and to be curious about that and to keep having that conversation. And I'm looking forward to having it more. Um, and I really will say that those conversations will involve um, the voice of trans women um, in, in doing so. And I'm, I'm acknowledging that as a non-trans woman myself, um, that I really look forward to the opportunity to centralise their voices in this particular discourse. Absolutely. And I think it really speaks to, um, if we think of notions of intersectionality, we think of writers like Bell Hooks and bringing the margins to the centres who has not been listened to and how can we centralize those voices not just for purposes of justice and correcting wrongs but for the benefit of all of us yes, yes. There's, a, there's a reason these voices have been excluded because they're powerful and they oh. speak they speak back like you made earlier the point earlier in the conversation by almost the sheer existence of this it it challenges the gender drivers it challenges patriarchy it challenges heteronormativity that's why people are so scared 
because it challenges power structures. But I think that's all the more reason for us to seek those out, bring them to the center and learn and listen, like you said. Mm, mm. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautifully said. So beautifully <laughs> said. Um, and I just want to thank that um, uh, one of your colleagues has sent to the chat um, the quote that um, I think my was based on and I'd like to hear, I'd like to read it out if that's okay. Cool. Um, um, which is the Akirabadi poet and educator. Um, uh, Teruaki Terero says, two ears, one mouth, don't talk too much. Learn to listen more, not only to hear, but to be able to develop another thing, and that is to be able to interpret. Mm -hmm. These things are different and they occur at different levels. Um, and I just, you know, that, that, you know, we should all have that framed on our wall, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's a, th thinking of quotes and stuff, there's another one that I'm re really reminded of and I've been reflecting on a lot through this project with you is about, and back to these notions of mutually reinforcing that we have shared struggle, shared uh, oppressing, oppression and all this kind of stuff is from Lilla Watson, who's the First Nations activist. Mm -hmm. And forgive me, so my head, so I might get a little bit wrong, but it basically says, if you've come to help me, don't worry about it. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let's work together. Let's get on with it. <laughs> yeah. And I love yeah. that. And, you know, that's obviously speaking from a particular struggle, but I, that sentiment mm. I think is really important. And, and it just, I think, feeds back into this idea that we've been talking about that none of this needs to displace the focus on women and violence against women. This is all, uh, as we said, it's all collaborative. It's all mutually reinforcing and it's to all of our ultimate benefit, I think. Mm. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think we're kind of getting towards the end of time, Jack. So I wanted to see if you wanted to answer any of questions. I'm not sure how many we will um, get time to get to. We'll just have a quick, was there any other, any other points you wanted? I might just have a quick look through the questions. If there's any other points you wanted to um, make while we still have a few minutes. Um, okay, so there's a couple of interesting questions here. What do I want to make? What do I want to say? I think as well, um, you know, I think it's really important to acknowledge we're at the beginning of a conversation. I just want to say we've touched on a lot here today. Um, and I can see there's a lot of people who are really excited in this moment in the chat who are sharing their enthusiasm and saying, um, you know, that this is bringing up some feelings and people quoting history, some people speaking from a, a newer position and some people spe speaking as more um, experienced uh, activists who's work, um, you know, we've got someone talking about going back to the 70s and um, the importance of that. Um, we're at the beginning of a really exciting time. The past is also really important as well. Um, but I think this is a really exciting time in history and it's important we figure out what are the individual opportunities to, um, to build on this. And mm -hmm. there are going to be a range of different spaces and conversations. I really want to invite everyone's participation as much as possible um, because that kind of participation is what's going to create the environment we will need to refine this work. Mm -hmm and to really tune in and build the evidence. Um, uh, our personal excitement is important, but we also need to test the ideas uh, yeah. and we need to approach this uh, from a curious, a curious way and be open to learning new things that might be outside of, in our blind spots as well, um, or to be open to some of our ideas needing refining or changing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. um, there's a question here. I just want to just to go back to something someone said earlier about the um, coroner's court. Yes, there is work to advocate around changing practice around gender and sexuality inclusiveness um, to speak to the diversity of relationships, genders and bodies in the coroner's space. Um, and that's emerging as we keep moving forward and we continue to advocate in that space. Mm -hmm. um, um, and that's another opportunity as well. I think we need to remember that um, that kind of civil society leadership and policy advocacy is really important and looking for opportunities to um, amplify each other's voices um, and to speak, um, to, to find ways of working together on each other's priority areas, uh, such as that coronial piece, such as we saw with marriage equality with so many um, uh, you know, women and feminists standing up uh, to support that work, um, uh, you know, we need we need to be looking at that kind of high level work as well. Yeah. 
Um, thank you for that one. There's, there's another question which I was hoping to answer, if you don't mind. Mm. Oh, it's a replicated um, question or theme from both the questions and the chat, which is just about um, messaging and values-based messaging. So I think one thing I just wanted to acknowledge into the comment made in the chat is this kind of conversation we're having right now and the language we might be using. Um, this is this is for practitioners. This is a, a very practitioner level yes. kind of conversation. Um, I wouldn't at all suggest, um, uh, th this would not be how I would speak um, in, in community to friends, outside the kind of practitioner bubble. I, I fully acknowledge that it's a bit jargonistic, it's a bit academic, um, or yeah, uses certain discourse which is not really um, but this, this, is, this is a kind of technical space, this particular conversation, but I completely take your point that um, probably down the track um, will be around how to trans, and I think that's a really great point made before about, oh, in that quote about interpreting, how do we interpret, translate? So I think um, I'm assuming, or maybe a question for you, Jackson, down the track will emerge what kind of messaging, language, um, yes. what we can use, how it's accessible, how it's inclusive. That's one of the things that we're testing in our work. Um, we've got, I won't speak too much to the projects because we don't want to save the surprise um, for the launch, but um, we are messaging is an important part of the work that we'll be doing and looking at messaging in a range of different ways, including campaigning and, and through a more direct um, engagement where you speak to an individual and offer them a resource um, to help them um, uh, do the work they need to do. To, to break down those things on a more individual level. Yeah. Um, there's one more question here which I find quite interesting and something we would have probably um, got to in our own conversation is um, a bit of the, uh, we've obviously emphasised a lot about the shared struggle. However, there are there can be tensions within this, like with any, with any um, activism, any work. So um, just a question here is um, kind of uh, advice about like how, how can we kind of resolve or straddle or, or make peace with these tensions. And I think probably one of the primary ones that comes up for people is about, do we lo lose the focus on women in mm. this? Mm. Absolutely. Um, but how do we also mm. make sure we don't continually um, push LGBTIQ people or causes kind of to the back because demographically there's smaller numbers. It's, you know, how, mm. so th those kind of tensions, if, if I'm getting this person's question right, that can you speak to that a little? Absolutely. I mean, I think that, and I th I'm really grateful for that question, can I just say, um, because um, courage and curiosity is going to be the answer here, um, as well as that empathy and respect. And I think part of it is what you said before, breathe and listening deeply. Um, but we also need to um, be trauma-informed in the work that we do. And some of these questions that can come up in these spaces can reinforce ideas that then themselves are harmful. And I think we need to just be aware of that and be respectful. And we need to learn and tune in and educate each other about those questions um, and think about what it is that we need to do to create uh, a, safe and, a safer and brave space, understanding that true safety may not be possible when we're learning. Mm -hmm. um, I think as well um, that how we relate to each other and how we build the relationship is going to be important, that we don't just, um, you know, I don't think this is a conversation that can happen on a Facebook page. I don't think we should be trying to have this conversation. Um, I'd be wary of even unfolding it here too much yeah. because it's not respectful yeah. and it's not humanizing and it's not connecting and it's not well paced. Um, coming as I do from a therapeutic background in group facilitation, the group process is important. It is more important than the words. We need to focus on those processes and we need to listen and we need to make sure that we're taking appropriate steps to protect um, the marginalized and the oppressed within those conversations. I think that's really important as well. Yeah. There are certain questions that aren't up for debate, um, yeah. such as anything that questions the validity or humanity or dignity of, any, of, of a group. Um, yeah. I think we can all agree on that. Um, um, we need to be very careful about that. Uh, and we need to um, uh, make sure that we don't have these conversations without the people who we're talking about. Because I think if we're, um, you know, just as though I think it would be dangerous for us to have a conversation in the LGBTIQ community without involving uh, women and victim survivors of family violence in that space, I would suggest it goes both ways. Yeah. Um, and I would actually, I would say very strongly, it goes both ways. So we need to make sure we're careful and intentional about who is in the conversation, that we don't have it as an add-on, 
Yeah. I think I would be very careful not to open it up too much at the end of a session like this. Instead, yeah. I would set up an intentional space and an, an intentional with um, checking assumptions and uh, building a common understanding before diving into the discomfort. Yeah, absolutely. And and even in this conversation, we're just two people. Um, you know, we don't represent nor speak for absolutely a whole a whole variety of people. And this is a certain format. It's a webinar. It's just like a kind of um, conversation. Yes, we have questions and chats, but I think there's a multitude of formats for different kinds of conversations facilitated, supported, different events. And I guess I just encourage people to uh, keep up with what's coming out and, and come along to things where that can be done in, in the kind of deep and respectful way that it needs to be done. Yes, um, and, and that space held in the way that it needs to be done. Like those of us in the um, Prevention of Violence Against Women space, we do training in communities of practice and facilitation skills because we understand um, that we are talking about emotion and violence and survivorship and uh, power differentials in the room. And yes. there's differences, but there's a similarity there with that. So I think it's about um, making sure we're using the right techniques at the right time for the right conversations. And I think just sh acknowledging our shared vulnerability in entering into conversations um, that f for many women, um, their experience their identity, um, their role has been questioned and attacked and their attempts to, um, their, their struggle and their resistance has been questioned and attacked as well. We've seen mm. the rise of the men's rights movement. We've seen um, uh, conversations where um, certain groups um, such as men's rights activists have attempted to insert themselves into the conversation to derail um, and rather than speaking um, appropriately in the right space about the work that men and boys need to do around their own, uh, you know, um, uh, gender work and um, to, you know, about the negative impact this has on their own health and their own mm. well-being, um, which is, you know, clear and measurable and undeniable um, yeah. without taking up the wrong space. Mm. And I really respect that. And uh, coming from the space that I do, I'm the, I'm, I'm, I stand arm in arm um, uh, with uh, the feminist movement and, and say, you know, that's unacceptable. Mm. Um, and uh, I think it's really important to say, just as I will stand arm in arm with my trans sisters and say, I will not allow your identity or validity to be questioned. And I will, I will not speak for you, but I will uh, always have your back. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think we need to be kind to each other while being firm about who we will not allow to be um, further victimized or marginalized or oppressed. So, yeah, kindness but firmness is what kind of comes through for me with those kind of conversations. So, mm. yeah. Um, I'm wondering, do you think we've got time for one more? Is there any more? We've got so many questions. <laughs> so a few of them I'm sure we can answer in kind of follow-up emails and things like that, um, particularly around links and resources. Um, is there anything else there that you think we'd be able to speak to um, in the few more minutes that we have? Um. A lot of them are great questions, which we would need hours to answer. So. I'm going to focus on the on the easy ones. Um, yeah. So there's a really great one. Where should I seek secondary consultation or refer any LGBTIQ identifying clients um, who have or experiencing family violence? It depends on where they live is the answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, um, Vaughan Harbour Health and Drama Street Services both offer community-led uh, uh, family violence services. Um, Switchboard, uh, QLife offers uh, after-hours family violence mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, line, which is a really great source of information. Mm -hmm. um, but also there's a range of rainbow tipped organisations that are in um, the, the Royal Commission into Family Violence funded uh, a range of organisations across Victoria, one, at least one in each region, uh, and a number of Aboriginal organisations as well to acknowledge that um, intersectional need um, to be safe pathways um, because different people uh, have a preference in different ways. Some people yeah. want to go to a community organisation um, run by and for LGBTIQ people. And some people would prefer to go to a mainstream local organisation. And the reasons for all of those are many and varied, but um, tuning into and, and looking into that is very important. But the LGBTIQ organisations that I spoke of do offer secondary consultation. Yep. And that is really important. I cannot emphasise enough um, for those of you who come from the service sector, the importance of doing that work. Um, and we also offer a, a training package um, to facilitate that um, dark side of the rainbow that can assist organisations in the service sector to become more inclusive. If they'd be interested, you can find that on the Rainbow Health website. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Oh goodness, there's so many good questions. There's so many questions. I, I guess I just want to acknowledge if anyone has asked questions that we haven't been able to get to today, like um, thank you so much still for submitting them. The, the, the rush of questions that we're getting, I think again, speaks to the excitement of this. So I guess, Jackson, is there anything like, I, I guess there's so much out there, it's hard to say maybe, but um, for all these people who are so interested in continuing, it's, it's amazing, continuing to learn uh, and part of this conversation, is there any way that you could kind of recommend people um, beyond what you've already said, I suppose. So we'll just keep watching the space as the project emerges. Absolutely. And I think there will be more, you will, you will hear more. We'll be making sure to disseminate um, resources and training as they become available, as we become aware of them. And as we uh, begin to bring our offerings into the space ourselves as a program, um, they will go out through this partners in prevention work. We, mm -hmm. This is all part of a, an emerging relationship between Rainbow Health Victoria um, and um, the mainstream prevention space. And we'll be absolutely sure to get things out there. Make sure it's in all your newsletters. It'll hit your inbox. Uh, yeah. All you need to do is keep your eyes out. Fantastic. Well, I think I might start to wrap it up there. And again, so sorry to everyone whose questions we can't get to. But like we said, this is the beginning of a much longer um, project piece of work, conversation space. Um, there'll be more opportunities in future, but um, there will be a follow-up email after this. So the resources that we've mentioned, a, a few of the questions were about what those were. So we'll be sure to include those um, so you can have a look. In. And there's some good places to start. Um, yeah, from, coming from a range of perspectives, but hopefully you can start to see the threads that are weaving through all of them. So um, um, yeah. my colleague Matt has reminded me as well. Yeah. Um, in my, um, in my excitement um, that we do actually, Rainbow Health Victoria does have a newsletter and can be found on our website and that can help you stay across a range of different um, capacity building and training and resources that we regularly put out. I can say that in the next 12 months, we've got some very exciting resources and research that will be uh, put out. We've got two of our major population health surveys. Um, this is me and um, Private Lives, the latest edition of these population studies with the largest ever populations we've ever, uh, numbers we've ever gathered are gonna be released over the next few months. And the reports, there's gonna be some learnings in there about family violence that will be really important, uh, um, as well as the uh, individual resources that will come out of that. So just keep an eye on that as well. Fantastic. And I'd say from um, DVRCV's point of view, keep an eye on um, our bulletin and on, um, for people who don't know, our base camp for prevention practitioners, where we share, um, we have discussions, chats, and we also have a huge resource bank where we can, uh, where we already have a lot of these resources, but we add them as they come out. So if you're not already in that, that can be a great thing to be a part of if you're a prevention practitioner. So I think oh, getting a little bit over time, so we're going to have to start wrapping it up there. Um, one thing I just ask every, if you have a moment, um, you'll receive a follow up email and it's also in the chat down there um, about if you have a few minutes to contribute to um, any feedback from this session, it would be um, hugely appreciated to um, help us continue improving these webinars, particularly as we move into this online space. Uh, thanks again, our, our second one um, in this online kind of situation. So thank you so much for your um, patience and um, excitement and bearing with us. So, cool. Yeah, thanks. It's been amazing, can I just yeah. say. Um, thank you Please. to you, Valinda. Thank you to DVRCV. Um, and um, thank you to all of you. I, I, I just, have the privilege of seeing this stream of amazing, inspiring, personal sharings coming through the comments and the questions. And um, yeah, I can't thank you all enough. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, I really look forward to opportunities to speak all of you in the real world when we yeah. actually all have to be in the same space and talk to each other again, which I'm just so excited about. So yeah. Um, yeah. It'll be fantastic. Um, and for, for everyone, and if, if you know people that weren't able to make it, um, you'll also receive a follow-up link with the recording of the webinar. As we said, it will go up onto our DBRCV um, YouTube page. Um, we'll have another PIP webinar soon, so keep your eyes peeled in for our bulletin. Information about that will be forthcoming. Um, yeah, I also want to thank you, Jackson. Thank you so much for this conversation. As you know, we could probably turn the camera off and talk for another 12 hours, but oh <laughs> we, contain, we contained it. That was good. Um, and yeah, like Jackson said, just the, the outpouring of interest in, uh, from your attendance, um, from the chat, from the questions is so motivating and heartening. And, and this work is, um, it's powerful. It is powerful. And to feel, to feel that, to feel that love and that recognition and that support, um, yeah, it's just 
what more can you say about it? It's just so heartening. And thank you all so much. So look forward to working guess, with each and every one of you. <laughs> totally, totally. And I guess, and on that note as well, um, yeah, I guess I just want to finish, finish today by acknowledging that these are still really unprecedented, quite isolating times that we find ourselves in. Um, even though it's digitally, thank you for this moment of, of connection with you all, even if it is mediated through a screen. Like Jackson said, I can't wait till we can be in the same room again um, and start having these conversations in a fuller um, physical kind of way. So um, yeah, I guess DVRCV, we are committed to providing as many opportunities as we can for us as a sector and a community um, and people who are committed to ending violence against women and, and LGBTIQ people and all people um, to come together and to connect. Um, so if you're not already a PIP member, that's the partnership, uh, Partners in Prevention Network that we have, I really encourage you to join. Um, you can come to more things like this, other events, and we keep you posted of what's going on. And yeah, in times like this, just another opportunity to stay connected. So thank you all so much. I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you.